1997, a pivotal year for Japanese role-playing games in the West, a year when what was once a relatively niche genre began to expand, grabbing the attention of the gaming world as a whole. While JRPGs had achieved some success in the past, there's one game in particular that really changed the tide of things. I am of course referring to the release of Final Fantasy VII for Sony PlayStation. Since its arrival 23 years ago, Final Fantasy VII has remained a fan favorite with numerous re-releases and spin-offs along the way. Its release signified a major shift within developer Squaresoft's approach to game development at the time while playing a significant role in the success of Sony's PlayStation. Now, all these years later, Final Fantasy VII has returned with a new take on the original tale with Final Fantasy VII Remake. For this special episode of DF Retro, we're going back to the beginning, to the original Final Fantasy VII, to explore its history, its development process, and the way in which it utilizes the PlayStation hardware. We'll also check out the original 1998 PC version from IDOS running on vintage hardware, while also discussing the spin-offs, films, and the new remake. All this and more is coming up on this episode of DF Retro. Let's mosey. To better understand the release of Final Fantasy VII, we must first go back to the time before PlayStation, when Nintendo dominated the market. Role-playing games were huge in Japan. The impact of Wizardry and Ultima gave way to the release of games such as Dragon Quest and eventually Final Fantasy. The Final Fantasy series quickly became a household name in Japan with six installments spread across Famicom and Super Famicom. Yet in the West, these games did not have the same impact. Yes, the Super NES received numerous localizations of popular Japanese role-playing games such as Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, and of course Final Fantasy, but none of them made a splash equivalent to Japan. At the time, it was thought that Japanese RPGs just weren't well suited to Western audiences. But as the 16-bit generation entered its twilight years, new technologies were looming on the horizon and 3D was quickly becoming the hot new thing. Yet, this was not a foregone conclusion for the Final Fantasy series. You see, after finishing development on Final Fantasy VI, the team began work on the next Final Fantasy game for Super Famicom. It would still be 2D and take place in New York in the year 1999, focusing on a detective known as Joe. This singular shot from the Final Fantasy 25th Anniversary Ultimania book showcases what it might have looked like. While some of these ideas would wind up in other games, such as Parasite Eve, this version was put on hold while key staff members would move over to help finish the Chrono Trigger project. With the next generation looming, however, Square began to consider how its RPGs might translate to new consoles, specifically in 3D. This led to experimentation and ultimately this now famous demo. Using characters from Final Fantasy VI, Kazuyuki Hashimoto spearheaded a team which would build a demo using silicon graphics technology. Known as Final Fantasy VI, the interactive CG game, the demo was created using Alias Power Animator and Soft Image 3D using powerful SGI workstations, similar to Rare's Donkey Kong Country released in 1994. The difference here is that this was a demo designed to be played in real time using an actual SGI workstation. Commands were issued using a mouse, resulting in characters engaging in battle in full 3D. This demo was showcased at SIGGRAPH 95 and left quite an impression on those that saw it. But this demo was often mistaken as the next installment in the series for Nintendo's next generation Ultra 64. It only made sense though, Nintendo was building its next console using SGI technology, so surely this is the next generation Final Fantasy, right? Well, after putting early hardware to the test, the team determined that Nintendo's next-generation console 
wasn't well suited to the type of game they intended to create, and it was dropped in favor of a new competitor in the console space, Sony's PlayStation. The hardware fit their objectives, and its appearance on PlayStation would also help elevate that platform. And thus, in the latter half of 1995, development of the game resumed. Hundreds of SGI workstations were purchased, and the team would go on to deliver the final game to the Japanese audience in January 1997. As expected, it was a hit, with more than 2 million copies sold in its first few days on the market. Yet despite this immediate success, the real challenge was still to come, launching Final Fantasy VII in the US and Europe. Leading up to this release then, it was decided that the game would be named Final Fantasy VII, just as in Japan, even though only three numbered entries existed in the West at this point. A bold move, perhaps, but one that helped synchronize the series worldwide. Thanks to a publishing deal, Sony and Square would work closely together on marketing and building hype in the West. Leading up to release, magazine articles teased its impending arrival. Pouring through issues of magazines such as GameFan, readers would be greeted with beautiful screenshots, artwork, and additional details on its upcoming release. The vibrant 3D graphics were tantalizing and served as a huge selling point something that would be utilized in the commercials showcasing the game's pre-rendered cinematics, promising players that perhaps have never played an RPG with spectacle, a movie-like experience. The most anticipated epic adventure of the year will never come to a theater near you. Final Fantasy VII. And it worked. When Final Fantasy VII released in North America on September 7th, 1997, it quickly became a smash hit. For many, it would be their first experience with an RPG. And while some longtime fans were disappointed with certain design decisions, it's difficult to deny the impact it had. At its core, Final Fantasy VII tells the story of Cloud Strife and his involvement with Avalanche as it attempts to put an end to the Shinra Corporation. What starts as a focused journey through a dark city on a quest to save the planet turns into a much grander adventure that takes players around the globe. The game focuses on themes and concepts which felt remarkably fresh and unique in 1997 while leaning into the anime aesthetic that was just beginning to catch on overseas as well. The timing was perfect. There's little doubt that the game was successful in pulling new players into the world of JRPGs, and I feel its storytelling, atmosphere, and streamlined battle system played a huge role here. Midgar is central to this. This multi-level dystopian nightmare offers an engaging stage for the player. The rich live on an upper level, a city on a plate elevated above the ground while the poor make do huddled below in small shanty towns hidden from natural sunlight. During the first chunk of the game, you'll spend a lot of time exploring Midgar and the developers really succeeded in creating something that felt truly lived in, with each environment showcasing a wealth of subtle details scattered about. And it was a shift in the design of JRPGs at the time, focusing on one single location for a significant chunk of time. This helps create a bond between the player and the city, in a way that no other Japanese role-playing game before it really had. Now, the other major draw stems from the battle system and character customization. Final Fantasy VII simplifies and streamlines the battle process. All actions have clear effects, and it's simple to configure your characters. The materia is key. The basic concept of slotting these materia spheres into your gear to build your character holds a lot of appeal, and it makes perfect sense even for newcomers to JRPGs. Now it's true, Final Fantasy VII is an easier game as a result, but I feel this type of release was important for pulling in newcomers. We needed an entry point like this to help grow the popularity of the genre. Of course, it's also worth noting that the US version features numerous changes compared to the Japanese original. The difficulty was toned down, and a slew of new cutscenes and sequences that missed the original launch were added. Japanese fans would later receive an international release featuring these changes, something that would become a tradition for the series going forward. But no matter where you were, it's the underlying presentation that perhaps helped sell the game to a wider audience. FF7 leveraged existing concepts in a smart way, taking full advantage of the CD-ROM format and the PlayStation hardware itself. 
Looking at the game in its entirety, it's easy to see several key areas where the game pushes the genre forward, with new techniques that had never before been seen in a game of this size. At the time, Final Fantasy VII was just this hugely impressive production, one of the most expensive and lavishly produced games ever made. The combination of high-end pre-rendered CGI sequences, detailed backgrounds, and 3D characters brought a new sense of depth to the world of role-playing games. It's difficult to underestimate just how remarkable the visuals were for 1997. It's also striking how, even now, the personality of each character manages to come through so well, something critical to the storytelling. It's the little things like the shrugs, the temper tantrums, or even the wave of a hand that are all delivered using these simplistic models. So much is communicated using so little. There's a real art to this, and they really pulled it off well. Even in 1997, voice acting had become somewhat common thanks to CD-ROM, but Final Fantasy really didn't need it. The characters' emotions and ambitions were always easily understood. So yeah, the visuals played a huge role in bringing the game to the masses. The large budget, beautiful presentation, and powerful marketing campaign were all so critical to its success. And it really showcased what was possible on the still new consoles of the day. But there are also constraints to consider. For an RPG to work at the basic level, the developers needed to overcome the constraints of the optical medium, namely loading. Players will spend time walking between different screens, engaging in battle, and organizing gear in the menus. If any of these elements take too long to load, the experience would be compromised. Which ties into how the game is architected. And thanks to research conducted by Joshua Walker and others many years ago, we now know more about how the game actually works. Basically, Final Fantasy VII is broken up into individual modules, different programs effectively that control different aspects of the game. This approach no doubt contributed to the speed of development by clearly dividing up the work, and in action, the game is able to quickly transition from one module to another with minimal loading. The central pillar on which the game is built then is the field module. This is responsible for allowing the player to explore the pre-rendered environments while displaying 3D polygonal models. The field module also has its own scripting system and movie playback is possible from within as well. The backgrounds are of course the key here. At the time, it wasn't possible to display this level of detail in real time, so many developers shifted towards generating artwork far more detailed than you could really display using powerful 3D workstations, then converting this into a format usable within the game engine. It's really nothing more than an illusion, but it was really effective, especially on low resolution 480i televisions using composite video. When displaying the backgrounds, the screen is divided up into a series of 16x16 16 tiles rendered in fast, unshaded 2D mode that are read into VRAM and updated every frame. The end result is surprisingly effective and it really helps create the illusion of actual depth within a scene, as if you're exploring a fully 3D environment. But it's not quite as simple as something like, say, Donkey Kong Country released in 1994, which works entirely on a two-dimensional plane. The 3D capabilities of the PlayStation were key to achieving the desired effect, and this is where the navigation mesh comes into play. As I discussed in my Resident Evil 2 video, the nav mesh defines where the player can move within each scene. By ensuring that it lines up with the 3D backgrounds, this combination helps give the illusion of characters moving in and out of high quality 3D renders. This depth is critical to building the illusion. Now the actual characters themselves are also rather interesting. The blocky looking figures look rather quaint by today's standards, but it feels like a stylistic evolution of the smaller sprites used in previous 2D Final Fantasy games. Characters are squat and somewhat super deformed in shape, but it works well enough. The triangle count is rather low during the sequences, but it is possible to display a large number of models on screen simultaneously. The models themselves, however, are smartly designed with minimal textures. Instead, vertex painting and shaded geometry is used to give the illusion of detail. The only real issue is the way the polygons are sorted, often clipping through one another, leading to distracting glitches. It's only really noticeable when characters are in close proximity to the camera, however. Now, another important feature of the game are the full motion video clips. 
These are sequences rendered out on SGI workstations and encoded in the PlayStation's motion JPEG format. In 1997, the production values here were lavish, but one key feature really stands out, and that is seamless transitioning. Basically, polygon models can be overlaid on top of FMV sequences, allowing the developers to seamlessly move from a static 2D background directly into video playback without removing the models. In some scenes, they even use full motion video as a background layer, lending the game a more animated appearance. The only limitation here is that layering isn't possible as the FMVs are just a single layer. Look closely at this frame from the FMV. Barrett's legs clip through the railing. One frame later, the normal background returns and the railing is now in front of Barrett as it should be. Still, most of the time it's only used to link 2D scenes together via FMV, like the introduction here where Cloud jumps off the train. It was a powerful moment. So this field system then was a key part of the game, both in terms of its visual identity and functionality. Any other module could be triggered from the field, and of course, one of the most important ones is the battle module. This is where PlayStation's 3D prowess is put to great use. The 3D battle system is perhaps one of the game's defining visual features. This is a full realization of the original Final Fantasy VI SGI demo from SIGGRAPH. To have a role-playing game with such a flexible camera system, detailed characters, and special effects was really unheard of at the time. To understand why it's such a big deal though, we need to consider the state of RPGs around this time. Earlier Final Fantasy games were presented like this, a side view with artwork and sprites facing one another. It works, but it's relatively static. At the time, it really wasn't immediately evident how this could be translated into 3D. And this is part of the reason behind those original CGI experiments, to better understand how a 3D camera might work within the context of an RPG. Now, prior to the release of FF7, most RPGs on PlayStation or Saturn were relatively basic in terms of the battle presentation. Wild Arms was one of the few exceptions appearing on PlayStation just a month or two prior to the release of FF7. It too features a 3D battle system, but it's extremely limited in comparison. Final Fantasy VII focuses on a very dynamic camera system with highly detailed character models and lots of flashy visual effects. As you attack and cast spells, the camera would swoop around the battlefield showing the action from different angles. It was a huge leap over previous installments and it really brought everything to life. It just felt more dynamic. This was an extremely influential game in that sense. But the smart decisions went beyond the camera system. The character models themselves are very well designed, sidestepping typical PlayStation limitations of the time. You see, like the field models, the battle models rely very little on textures for detail. Instead, details represented using shapes and color. As a result, the models are very clean and defined. They manage to completely sidestep the texture warping and other issues that were common in PlayStation games at the time, and they look great. This would also mean that these models would be more suitable to an increase in resolution, which becomes important with later ports. Beyond the main characters, for the first time, enemies are also fully animated with the same level of polish as those main characters. There's just a ton of detail in every model. But perhaps the most striking addition are the summons. When these powerful guardians are unleashed in battle, the game displays an often lengthy, complex animation sequence involving the guardian dealing huge damage to your foes. The quality of these sequences was simply unheard of at the time, and they became so popular that the follow-up game, Final Fantasy VIII, would perhaps lean too far into the concept. Even today, 23 years after its original release, I think these sequences managed to hold up brilliantly. The only downside to the battle system, though, is the frame rate. These battles update at around 15 frames per second, even though the field map itself is 30. Perhaps the team wanted to match the frame rate to the low number of frames used for the animations, and perhaps the animation data was kept to a minimum in order to keep loading from becoming a problem. But that's just a guess. Thankfully, there is an upside. The team utilized PlayStation in a rather unique way. The menu system below the battle scene operate at a higher frame rate, 60 frames per second in fact, which means the interactive section, moving the cursor and selecting your desired actions, updates at a much smoother frame rate. 
So looking back, I'm rather impressed with how seamlessly the battle system integrates into the main game. Despite the lavish animation, loading into battle is relatively quick. Really, it's a showpiece for the system, and one that still holds up rather well today. But there's still three other modules to discuss. The world map is rendered in full 3D like the battle system. Square had previously relied on Mode 7 for the Super NES RPGs to allow for smooth rotation, but PlayStation enabled the team to integrate a fully 3D map for the first time. It helps better define the world, and there's plenty of secrets to find along the way. Speaking of the world map, one of the best decisions the development team made is concealing this world map until many hours into the game. You spend those early hours of the game working your way through Midgar, really getting to know the city and the characters along the way. It's a great example of pacing in an RPG. Eventually, you reach the edge of the city only to realize that the adventure has just begun and there's a massive world awaiting you. It's a brilliant moment. And that escape from Midgar also brings us to the next module, the minigames. This is yet another example of a separate 3D engine designed to handle sequences such as this motorcycle battle. Here, everything is displayed in full 3D. They're a fun distraction and another unique element in the game, something that is carried over somewhat to the new remake, curiously enough. Lastly, there's the whole menu system, which is its own unique module. This is where you manage your characters between battles and save your game, basically it's only accessible from the field system. The multi-module approach seems to work well in this game, and it's fair to say that the game wowed audiences upon release. Another key element with any RPG is of course the soundtrack. Composed by series veteran Nobuo Uematsu, Final Fantasy VII marks his first foray into the world of CD-ROM, but in reality it uses a more tried and true method. Rather than using pre-recorded audio, which could have impacted loading, FF7 takes advantage of the PlayStation sound chip to play sequenced music tracks instead. It's a natural progression from the SPC 700 and the Super NES, and many PlayStation games would utilize this method. As the composer has full control over instrument samples, the results varied significantly from game to game. In the case of FF7, Uematsu retains a rather old-school feel with simple instrument samples. It's an upgrade over what was possible on Super NES, but it's rather conservative overall. I still think the soundtrack is rather memorable, however, with a lot of great tracks. But one of the standout moments in the game appears at the very end while facing off against Sephiroth, the famous One-Winged Angel track. Everyone knows this track today, but utilizing vocal samples was a brilliant move, allowing a richer soundscape than what was possible on previous generation consoles. It's a fantastic example of what is possible. And really, looking back, the release of FF7 was an example of right time, right place. The PlayStation was taking off in a big way. The presentation and mix of science fiction with fantasy was hugely appealing during that era, anime was becoming more popular, and the marketing campaign was brilliantly executed. It was also a well-playing RPG that is not especially difficult. For many people, it was their first real introduction to the world of JRPGs, and everything just kind of comes together really well. It has its flaws, for sure, but it's a great way to introduce new players to the world of JRPGs. The impact of Final Fantasy VII remained evident as the console generation continued as well. 1998 saw the release of Air Guys, God Bless the Ring. Developed by Dream Factory, this 3D fighting game was released in arcades first before appearing on the PlayStation and it includes several key characters from Final Fantasy VII, including Cloud, Tifa, Sephiroth, Vincent, Yuffie, and Zack Fair. It's an interesting game too, a sort of 3D fighter crossed with wrestling to some degree. In many ways, it resembles Capcom's Power Stone, only with smaller environments. 
It also runs using the PlayStation's interlaced mode at a full 60 frames per second. This was Dream Factory's second major game with Squaresoft, the first being the original Towball, and it works rather well. In fact, Air Guys is a great example of how the popularity of Final Fantasy VII specifically started bleeding over into other genres and games. Its success was hugely influential at Square. It was this success, though, that led to another major shift for the company. Square wanted to release Final Fantasy VII on the PC. During the mid-90s, the PC was very much its own thing, a platform with its own set of games focused on a different sort of gamer, but publishers did often try their hand at console conversions. And now Square wanted to try their hand as well, a first for the publisher. They needed a partner to make it happen though, and this is where the relationship with IDOS Interactive began. Due in part to their success managing Tomb Raider, Square wanted to work with them on the conversion of Final Fantasy VII for the PC. A deal was struck, the game was developed, and it would arrive on the PC platform during the summer of 1998, a little over a year after its original appearance on PlayStation. The idea of a JRPG such as this on the PC, however, was a somewhat foreign concept at the time. Yet despite this, it received plenty of hype and coverage leading up to its release. The PC crowd was well aware of the hype around the game, and this was their chance to try it. But despite capable hardware, porting the game to the PC would be no easy task. The world of PC graphics cards was convoluted, and standards were still in their infancy. With the right components, PCs were very capable of high-quality 3D, but there was a huge variation between low- and high-spec PCs. In bringing the game over to the platform, IDOS was faced with translating each of the five separate modules, almost as if they were five unique engines, over to the platform. They worked from outdated source code and had limited access to assets. The PC version ships on four discs, three game discs, plus an install disc, and offers the option to install the full thing to your hard drive. I purchased this copy back in the summer of 1998, shortly after it was released. With this in mind then, let's examine what works and what doesn't with this original PC release. For any comparisons, know that all capture was done using a Pentium 3 500MHz system equipped with a 3DFX Voodoo card. Now FF7 supports 3D acceleration via Direct3D, but out of the box, support is surprisingly limited. While the spine of the packaging indicates support for PowerVR cards, for instance, unfortunately this is not the case, a problem I faced personally back in 1998 with my Matrox M3D PowerVR based card. The lack of support for 8-bit palletized textures is the culprit here. Basically, color data for the textures on PlayStation is pulled from color lookup tables, but this is something that not all video cards at the time could support. Now, additional support was later added for NVIDIA's TNT and Reva 128 cards, but still, overall support for 3D graphics cards was rather limited. As such, the 3DFX Voodoo card is the best choice here. On the positive side, this means the PC version can support a 4x resolution increase over the original PlayStation game, rendering it 640x480. All real-time 3D elements are rendered using this higher resolution, appearing cleaner than the PS1 version, while the entire UI has been reworked with higher resolution fonts and character portraits. On the flip side, the background artwork retains the same low 320x240 pixel count of the original game. This is likely due to both the difficulty in implementing higher resolution assets, at least in terms of alignment, and lack of access to the original SGI workstations for rendering new versions of the background. Those stations were likely in use for the development of Final Fantasy VIII. Plus, there would have been disk space issues as well. The reason this is an issue is that the real-time 3D elements no longer match the resolution of the backgrounds, which creates a sort of mismatch between the two that I found rather distracting. In comparison, at first glance at least, the battle sequences look excellent on the Voodoo card. The shaded polygon design of the character scales beautifully to 640x480, and everything is just much sharper. If you look deeper, however, issues begin to pop up. Basically, it comes down to how the game is being rendered using 3D acceleration. The mix of higher resolution output with bilinear texture filtering causes problems with certain visual effects. For instance, the shadows below the characters exhibit a more defined outline, which makes it seem as if there's just a dark circle below them. 
it looks less pleasing than the PlayStation version. Or this scene early in the game, the distant building contrasts incorrectly against the background. Or late in the game, the floating rocks here all exhibit black outlines as a result of the texture filtering while distant backgrounds show noticeable edges between each surface. Summons also reveal similar problems, like the hole that appears beneath Ifrit when you summon him. The color is inverted on PC. Textures on models such as this exhibit visible black lines that aren't present on PlayStation. Or perhaps these lightning effects, which just look ugly when filtered. Another issue is performance. The 3D sections still render at the same low frame rate as the PlayStation version, but the UI situated beneath the battles also updates at this low frame rate rather than 60 FPS like on PlayStation. I suppose this split window design of the original wasn't possible to implement on the PC. So you can expect a lot of minor issues like this, which I feel detract slightly from the presentation. It does improve when using the software renderer, however, which is more accurate to the PlayStation version, but the software rendering is obscenely slow in this game, even on a PC well beyond the recommended spec. So in that sense, visual quality is just mixed. Some elements are improved, but others feel like a step back from the PlayStation original. This also applies to the full motion video clips, which appear to have been ripped from the PS1 game, then re-encoded using Duck True Motion, which produces vastly inferior results. The videos are much grainier than the original game by a large margin, which also means that they no longer blend well when transitioning from the 2D backgrounds. But perhaps the most significant change stems from the music. There was not enough disk space available to utilize pre-recorded music tracks, and many popular formats simply didn't exist at the time. The PlayStation version relies on the system's audio chip to process sound, but PCs feature a wide range of sound hardware, and thus the decision was made to utilize MIDI. The game ships with a Yamaha Soft XG player, but also supports hardware XG solutions, as well as General MIDI, Creative Sound Blaster, all series cards, and FM synthesis. So, let's compare a few options then, shall we? First, this is how this track should sound in its original form. And this is the software synthesizer included with the game. It's not bad, is it? But it has a significant CPU cost, which is an issue for PCs closer to the minimum requirements, especially when coupled with software rendering. FM synthesis is also an option. In this case, I used the AW64's creative music synth capabilities for playback, which unfortunately sounds somewhat worse than a real Yamaha OPL chip, but it's still reasonably comparable. doesn't sound great, does it? Then we have the AW64 synth using general MIDI data. Unfortunately, I'm using an AW64 value, which only has 512 kilobytes of RAM and cannot take advantage of the proper sound faults intended for it. Still, it's not too bad. Then we have an actual Roland Sound Canvas SC55 using general MIDI data. This was the de facto standard for PC MIDI back in the day, but FF7 is a weird one in that it's one of the few games designed instead for Yamaha's XG standard. Still, it sounds pretty crisp and clean for the most part.
Not bad, right? Though the sound canvas sounds a lot better in most other games. Now one major issue with MIDI playback in this game is that most hardware and software solutions lack the vocal track used during One Winged Angel. With general MIDI you get something like this. There is one exception, however. When using the sound fonts designed for AW64 or AW32, you can get these samples instead. And it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? So when it comes to audio, the solution used here was certainly variable. Yet I still feel the PlayStation original sounds better overall. But some tracks are quite good via MIDI playback. Given the choice, I'd go with the soft XG player or an actual XG MIDI module. Though that won't provide you with the vocals during One Winged Angel. Of course, the chances of actually playing this original version today are rather slim, as it doesn't run natively on modern PCs. There are fixes, of course, but it's not the easiest thing to run. And it's a strange beast overall. When running at its best on period-appropriate hardware, it does offer noticeable improvements over PlayStation, but also falls short in other areas. At the same time, it also launched with plenty of bugs and issues, including limited support for 3D cards and problems running on certain CPUs. It just wasn't that well suited to PCs of that era, but it was a successful experiment and it sold very well. Two years later, Final Fantasy VIII would also make an appearance on the PC. Now, over time, this original PC version has become rather central to the release of this game, with most of the subsequent re-releases being based directly on this code. Starting in 2012, the game would be remastered, so to speak, using this original version as the base. It started first on the PC, but would eventually roll out to all the various consoles, including the Nintendo Switch, which is the version we're looking at here. Thankfully, there are numerous changes from the original PC release. Everything is now rendered at an even higher resolution, but the method of filtering produces very soft polygonal edges that actually looks really nice in battle. Unfortunately, the background graphics all use a strong bilinear filter that produces rather smeary results, as opposed to the more pixelated look of the original PC release. The same goes for the FMVs, which are at least now based on the PS1 version, so they look a lot cleaner than the Duck True Motion videos. Beyond that, the music was also upgraded. The MIDI is replaced with AUG files that contain the original PlayStation soundtrack, so that problem is taken care of as well. This version also offers features such as the option to disable random battles, power up your characters, or increase gameplay speed by 3x, basically a fast forward mode. And if you're playing the PC version, it's possible to make use of various mods created by the community, everything from enhancing movie files using AI upscaling, to improved background rendering, and further enhanced music. It's all possible. Of course, FF7 also saw release on the PlayStation Classic, and as a downloadable title for PS3, PSP, and the Vita. These are all based on the PlayStation 1 original. So, there exists a lot of ways to play Final Fantasy VII today. Personally, I prefer the original, where everything feels consistent, but it is nice to have various options for revisiting it. I just wish the later conversions had been derived more directly from the PlayStation 1 release since they still exhibit some of the visual glitches present in that initial 1998 PC version. But if we rewind back to the late 90s, after the game first hit the PC, Final Fantasy 7 quietly handed the spotlight over to its sequel, Final Fantasy 8. 
Final Fantasy VIII made a splash when it was released in 1999, and this continued with Final Fantasy IX and eventually Final Fantasy X on PlayStation 2. Yet fans of Final Fantasy VII couldn't forget it quite that easily. Which perhaps explains why Final Fantasy VII returned to the spotlight in 2003, when Square, now Square Enix, announced the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. It started with the announcement of Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, a film based on the characters of Final Fantasy VII that would take place after the events of the game. It was supposed to have been the first product released in the compilation, but it was beaten to market by, before Crisis, Final Fantasy VII, a mobile phone game. This hails from the days when Japan had the most advanced phones in the world. It was released in 2004 and takes place six years before Final Fantasy VII, with players assuming control of the Turks, a covert group of operatives working for Shinra. Unfortunately, it's one game I have very little experience with, but it does at least exist in a remade, translated form for those curious. Then the following year, Final Fantasy VII Advent Children finally arrived, as a sort of sequel to the original game in movie form. The story was told through lavish CGI visuals with an impressive new musical score. It started life as a short film produced by Visual Works, a company involved in creating pre-rendered CGI movies for some Square Enix games, but it was eventually spun out into a full-length feature film. It was released straight to DVD, first appearing in 2005 in Japan. The storytelling certainly received its fair share of criticism, but I think it's a beautiful example of a CG movie for the time. Its release is also interesting, as this is not the first time that a film based on Final Fantasy had been created. Series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi had assembled a team years earlier in Hawaii to produce Final Fantasy The Spirits Within a film that sought to create digital humans all the way back in 2001. While the movie has its critics, I feel it was an important step forward in numerous key areas. The process of building the models, painting the world, capturing the performance of the actors and actresses, in some ways mirror modern game development. And while we've come a long way in terms of visual representation of humans in films, it feels like it was a large influence. I can imagine that some of the techniques pioneered in this film would have a huge influence on both the film and video game mediums, even if it wasn't a huge success at the time. Either way, both Spirits Within and Advent Children are two very different films, but they highlight just how important the series had become at this point, due in part to the success of Final Fantasy VII. But there were other attempts to bring Final Fantasy into the world of passive media. Initially released alongside Advent Children, for instance, Last Order Final Fantasy VII is an OAV animated by Madhouse, a prolific producer of Japanese animation. This piece recreates key flashbacks from the original FF7 using high quality animation. There's also On the Way to a Smile, an episodic piece originally available via the Advent Children website. Each of these releases demonstrate the hunger that fans had for Final Fantasy VII, and each of them helps flesh out the FF7 universe. Of course, prior to the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, there had been other attempts to fuse Final Fantasy with the world of anime, namely Final Fantasy Legend of the Crystals. This was initially released all the way back in 1994, and took place 200 years after the events of Final Fantasy V. Curiously, this was animated by the same studio that did Last Order Final Fantasy VII, Madhouse. But it wasn't over yet, there were still two other games released as part of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. The first of these was announced in 2004 for PlayStation 2, Dirge of Cerberus Final Fantasy VII. This is effectively a third-person shooter based on the character Vincent Valentine from the original Final Fantasy VII. The game was released in 2006, a very late generation PlayStation 2 title, and it definitely had its fair share of technical issues, but it was still an interesting release. Tech-wise, the game targets 60 frames per second, but often falls short, leading to a rather unstable experience. Despite that, it still has a rather nice look to it, and it plays surprisingly well. 
It's an interesting experiment then. This is the first time the staff had tackled a shooter like this, and Dirge of Cerberus manages to combine light RPG elements with both first and third person action. During play, the game will regularly present stage mission objectives to the player, such as escorting a squad to an objective or finding a piece of data somewhere in the mission. They even manage to fit in a turret segment just for good measure. It's clearly a game inspired by western shooters of this era, but it has its fair share of Square Enix flavor as well. Now over the course of the game, you'll visit numerous areas from Final Fantasy VII after the end of the original game. This helps give you a better idea of what happened to the world. I certainly enjoyed exploring locations such as the ruined Shinra building in the center of Midgar. It also offers some unexpected features such as mouse and keyboard support. The original Japanese version even included multiplayer and support for the PlayStation 2 hard drive, both of which were removed for the Western release. Dirge also features an exceptional soundtrack composed by Masashi Hamauzu, the same composer responsible for the soundtrack in the Final Fantasy VII Remake. It really is a remarkable soundtrack. Even better, Japanese sensation Gact produced two songs for the game, including the title track Redemption, which, by the way, received two music videos released on a standalone DVD. <laughs> Dirge of Cerberus was not especially well received at the time, but it has its charms and is an interesting side story worth checking out. It's also worth noting that Dirge received a side story in the form of Dirge of Cerberus The Lost Episode, and this one was also a mobile phone game, and pushes 3D visuals, which for 2006 was kind of impressive. Unlike before Crisis, this one was released in North America. Now the final game, bookending the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, is perhaps the best of the bunch, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII for PSP. Directed by Hajime Tabata, the man who helped get Final Fantasy XV back on track, Crisis Core is an impressive action RPG for the system. One of the most ambitious handheld games ever created at the time of its release. The initial idea was to release an enhanced version of Before Crisis for PSP, but this was ultimately shelved in favor of a prequel telling the story of Zack Fair, who had previously appeared in an important flashback in the original Final Fantasy VII. The relationship between Zack and Cloud is rather complex, yet central to the original game, and this PSP game is designed to flesh out Zack prior to these events. What makes it so impressive though stems from the production values. You have to remember, this was a game created for a handheld system released in 2004, yet it looks like this. It basically matches the production values of a PS2 game, but in portable form. The quality of the character models and environments really is something special for the system. It also takes full advantage of the extra cash available on PSP 2000 and up, allowing for fast loading. Unlike the original, Crisis Core is an action RPG at its heart with a roulette based system known as DMW adding an element of luck to the combat. Unfortunately, this is one game that isn't easy to get your hands on unless you still own a PSP or 10 like I do. The game was released only on UMD and never received a digital release. It has never been officially re-released either. It's a true PSP exclusive. Following this release, however, Square Enix shifted most of their Final Fantasy focus over to the in-development Final Fantasy XIII instead, and Final Fantasy VII went quiet once again. Yet, there was always something there, a spark waiting to happen. This spark was first lit in the mid-2000s during the reveal of PlayStation 3. Square Enix shared a concept trailer showcasing what might be possible on PlayStation 3 by recreating the introduction sequence for Final Fantasy VII in HD at 60 frames per second. It looks incredible, and its appearance immediately fired up the hype train for a potential remake of the original game, 
Yet, despite this, such a remake never materialized and hope faded once more. But the rumors were not so easily extinguished. The year was 2014, one year after the release of PlayStation 4. The event, the PlayStation Experience. Almost two hours into this trailer-packed show, Shinji Hashimoto from Square Enix stepped on stage to reveal Final Fantasy VII for PlayStation 4. Now, three generations later, we are bringing that title back to the PlayStation. the PC port. It's a moment I'll never forget. For a split second, it seemed, however remote, as if there was the possibility of a proper remake being announced. After all, rumors had been circulating for quite a while now, but those dreams were quickly crushed. That is, until the Year of Dreams, aka the Sony E3 press conference 2015. It started with the re-reveal of the long-awaited The Last Guardian. But this was just the beginning. Halfway through the conference, this happened. Long ago, we looked upon a foreboding sky. The memory of the star that threatened all burns eternal in our hearts. In its wake came an age of silence. Yet with each fond remembrance, we knew those encountered were not forgotten. That someday we would see them again. It's difficult to describe the impact this simple trailer had on the audience. That which fans had been waiting for for years was suddenly to become reality. This was a powerful shared moment for anyone watching. And over the next few years, development would change hands and more of the game was slowly revealed. It quickly became clear that this was to be a huge project and a major installment in the series. Now, after years of anticipation, Final Fantasy VII Remake is real and in the hands of fans around the world. This is a massive project that seeks to expand upon the original game across multiple parts. What we have today is just part one, but it's several times larger than the original Midgar section, letting players explore parts of the city that were previously unknown, while expanding upon the story in numerous ways. Everything has been overhauled, yet it retains much of what made the original game so compelling. The opening moments reveal so much about the care poured into this release. And this is what I love so much about it. The remake offers a completely different style of battle system while greatly expanding upon each area, yet it retains the feeling of Final Fantasy VII so well. The run on the Mako reactor during the introduction sequence is a perfect example. They even managed to retain the seamless transition from FMV to real-time graphics, only this time the difference is much less pronounced. It's a fascinating take on the concept of a remake as well. It retains many of the story beats found in the original game, but the shift in gameplay and introduction of new twists result in something rather different. Perhaps the most striking element here, however, are the visuals. We've already discussed some of the technology behind this Unreal Engine 4 powered game, including the texture issues, but when it's firing on all cylinders, the result is magical. Remake features some of the finest real-time cinematics I've ever seen in a video game, which make for an interesting contrast against previous forays into the realm of cinema. In many ways, the real-time visuals in this game outshine the pre-rendered, film-quality visuals featured in Final Fantasy VII Advent Children and Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. The raw geometric detail perhaps isn't on par, but the quality of the shading, the skin, the clothing, all of this is a dramatic improvement over those films. It almost starts to feel as if those movies were simply a preview of where Square Enix intended to go with its games. 
Experiencing this world again with this level of fidelity is truly a powerful experience for those of us that grew up with the original game. Everything just feels right, even when it pushes so far beyond what was once possible. It's also worth noting that Final Fantasy VII Remake is an example of a game that has improved visually since its earlier media. Compared to this late 2015 trailer, for instance, it's clear that the visual quality, shading, animation work, and more have all been massively overhauled. Now, it's likely that this trailer was made from the original version of the remake in development, but it is neat to see that the vision is similar to that trailer, but the visual quality has improved significantly. It's rare that we can point to a game that actually looks better in its final form compared to its initial media. And we've come so far. Final Fantasy VII pushed CG rendering to new levels upon its release, as we've discussed during this episode, but Final Fantasy VIII, which followed it up just a couple years later, took things even further. Then, on PlayStation 2, we started to receive games with real-time graphics that managed to convey the feeling of those original pre-renders at a full 60 frames per second, while the PlayStation 3 generation managed to push things even further in terms of rendering quality. This generation of consoles, however, really brought us so much closer to matching and exceeding those pre-rendered sequences in so many ways. In that sense, I can't wait to see what the next installment in the Final Fantasy VII Remake will hold. And with that, we've reached the end of this journey through the world of Final Fantasy VII. I hope you've enjoyed this tour as we explored the original release its various conversions, the related media, and the remake. Revisiting the game for this episode took me right back to 1997 when it was released, reminding me what a special time in the world of games that time period truly was. And it was just the beginning. In many ways, Final Fantasy VII is a game that helped shape the state of video games as we know them today. Those cinematic aspirations grew up alongside the PlayStation itself and while there have been up and downs over the years, there's little doubt that it was one of the most important releases of the generation. Love it or hate it, Final Fantasy VII has earned its spot in history.